Francis wanted me to share these uh, notes with you, first of all, just to thank the uh, Bioinformatics Workshop, but also to say that all the lectures are going to be made available. So it's going to be up and access. Or you can share them and everything, but you've got to make sure that you follow these rules if you do so. So we're talking about missing values and uh, how to deal with these in R. Um, but before we go on and talk about that, I'd like to say a few words. Um, during the break, I was asked a couple of questions about forums and things about where you can ask questions about R. And also, I was asked about uh, what about MATLAB. <coughs> um, so for those who don't know MATLAB, MATLAB is a very popular uh, software for, um, I would say it's more geared towards uh, mathematicians and, and uh, engineered applied mathematicians. Uh, it's a commercial software, it's very powerful, you can do lots of things. You can also use it for bioinformatics, they also have uh, packages and tools. Um, and don't get me wrong, it's a very, very good package and in some level it's more powerful than R. You can do things that R can't. So if you're looking for software to do image analysis, you know, MATLAB is still uh, the best thing you can use probably for that. On the other hand, it is commercial, it's fairly expensive. Um, so maybe it's not a big deal for you, you can afford to buy a license, you know, your company or your institution or your school, whatever, probably has uh, licenses you can use. But the downside of that is that, first of all, we couldn't really do a workshop like that, right? Because we couldn't expect everyone to have a license because it is very expensive. Um, also, there's going to be less people that are going to be using that software, um, MATLAB, for example, versus R, because it is more expensive, it is not open source, you cannot, do, you cannot know exactly what it does. Um, so the community around you is going to be a lot smaller because there's going to be less people that are going to contribute new things and new packages for you to use. Of course, you're going to have a full uh, customer support with MATLAB, right? So you can call them, say, hey, it's not working, you know, fix it for me. Uh, I'm not sure they will do it, and probably if they do it, it's, it's going to take a while. On the other hand, you don't have that with R, but you have your community around you. So. There's tons of mailing lists for the R users, and I can assure you that if you've got a questions and you ask a question on the mailing list, you're going to get an answer in probably in less than five minutes. I mean, it is truly amazing how many people are working using R and can help you doing things. Of course, you know, if you do that today and say, oh, this is great, you know, this, there's all these uh, mailing lists, I'm just going to you know, subscribe to the mailing list, and I'm going to say, how do I create a vector? people are going to be very angry at you if you ask questions like that just because probably a lot of people have asked the same question in the past and you can just parse you know the old mailing list and get the answer without parsing it again so if you decide to do that and I encourage you to do it if you don't mind receiving about you know 10,000 emails per day then do it go ahead um, and the good thing is that not only you're going to be able to ask questions that you know are not answered already on uh, the, the archive of the mailing list but also you're going to be able to help people that are asking the same questions in the future, you know. Um, if someone is asking about how to do something and you know how to do it, you can answer right away. Um, and it is truly amazing. So even though you don't have customer support, I think you have a much better support that's coming from the community, people who are just like you working <coughs> using R. Um, so if you go on the R website, you will see that there are several mailing lists and some of them are more targeted than others. There's just a general R mailing list. Um, I'm subscribed to the R Mac mailing list because it, it, it tells you more about the things that are uh, specific for R, like the GUI and things. I'm also subscribed to the one of the Bioconductor mailing lists, which is on high throughput sequencing. Um, this is something that I'm not really going to talk about during this workshop just because the data sets that are generated by high throughput sequencers are very large and sometimes can be sort of cumbersome for an introduction to R. Um, but there's been tons of support uh, in uh, Bioconductor for high throughput sequencing. There's lots of packages already. There's something like five people at the uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center working on uh, these packages all the time. And I'm subscribed to that mailing list, and I receive so many emails a day on what's going on, how to do things. And people say, hey, by the way, can we do that with this package? No, but let me do it. And one hour later, you can do it. I mean, it is truly amazing. So I really encourage you to do it. Um, so this is just to say that R is maybe not uh, fully supported with, uh, by a company, but there's the community around you, and I think that is actually much better. OK, so going back to missing values. 
um, so in statistics and um, in bioinformatics, you're going to have lots of missing values, right? I mean, if you do a, a, an expression, a gene expression experiment, and you have, let's say, mice, and uh, you do, you need to do some culture on these mice, take some samples, some of the mice maybe will die uh, uh, sooner, uh, and therefore you will have some missing data, and you need to deal with that. You're just, you're not just going to throw away the experiment because you know um, one of the values is missing. So one way you can deal with that is using the symbol or just any, which means that there's a missing value. So what you can do here, we can create a vector, and if one of the values is missing, okay, let's say this was um, a few patients that you were uh, that you had weights on, then you will have all the weights for the patients you could actually weight, but there's one that is missing, so you just put an any. So the bad thing about missing values is that if you don't know how to deal with them, R is going to tell you, well, there's a missing value, what do I do? So let's try to see how that works. So here's the example. We have the missing value. Copy and paste that into the console. We can look at the values, and you can see that there's an NA. So it is just a, a, a numerical vector, okay, just numbers, but because there's a missing value, there's NA. Now, if I want to compute the mean, and we're going to see that later on in the exploratory data analysis, we can just do mean of weight. Well, R says there is a missing value. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to deal with it, right? Because there is something that's missing, so I don't just compute the mean of that sample. However, there are ways to deal with it. So if you look at question mark mean, you will see that there's an option that says R you know, how are you going to deal with the missing value? One way to deal with it is to do NA that RM equal true, meaning remove the missing value and compute the mean. Okay? So if you do that, what it's going to do is just going to remove that missing value and compute the mean of the remaining numbers. So that's really nice because there are ways to deal with missing values. And um, I would say most of the functions in R have that way to deal with missing values. And this is an option that you're going to find into a lot of functions when you uh, try to do summary statistics on a sample. Is the na.rm equal true or false? False, it's the default. That is, it doesn't do anything big because there's missing value. If you turn it to true, you're just going to remove the missing value and uh, you're going to uh, deal with the remaining data points. Sorry. Yes? So, why is the default the false? The true and not the false, because obviously most people would be willing to remove the missing value and compute Because them. sometimes you should not remove them. Actually, there are many cases where, you know, if you remove them, you're going to get a biased sample, right? So let's say you're looking at um, survival rate, and, you know, some people are going to die. Say, so, well, I just remove them. And of course, you know, the survival rate is great because you removed all the missing values, right? So you shouldn't do that. So you need to be a little bit careful about the way you should handle missing value. And in fact, the best way to do it is by turning uh, so yeah. that by default to false. Okay. Yeah. It, and is it the way of telling our other ways of coding uh, missing values that when you import data in other, from other uh, software? Uh, and you can tell, okay, MS means NA. Yes, so that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of things. Let me remind you, we only have a couple of days here, so obviously we're not going to know everything after two days, right? Um, so try to ask the question, as you know, that you want answer for uh, in these two days. But if not, you can always use, you know, question mark, help, and so forth. We're going to see how we can read in data sets. One of the commands is read that table. We'll see that. And one of the options is how do we deal with missing data? By default, it will do something, but maybe it's not exactly what you want. Maybe you have got a special code for your missing data. But I would say that in many software, NA is pretty standard, so typically it will know what to do and how to deal with this. Uh, but if not, you can sort of uh, tune that uh, to your data set. OK, so th this is just to tell you that there's another type or special kind of thing that you can see in R, which is NA for missing data. And we'll talk a little bit more about missing data when we encounter them, but for now we don't. We're not really going to worry about that. Okay, so here's another way. <clears throat> so we've talked about vectors. Okay, vectors are nice, but it will be nice to have another way to uh, um, uh, to summarize data in R or to assign data in R. 
is using what we call matrices or arrays. So a matrix is just a two-dimensional array where you're going to get numbers in your array. Um, of course, because R is also a statistical and therefore kind of like a mathematical package, you can work on matrices. So if you know what a matrix is, you can do matrix multiplication, you can do inversion, you can do lots of fancy things with matrices, which we're not really going to talk about. Uh, however, a matrix is just a way also to hold a table. Okay, So we're going to play with that a little bit. Okay, so we're here, so here. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're going to use a command that you've never seen before. So this is another way to create a vector. Okay, This is saying, let's create a vector going from 1 to 12, okay, spaced by 1. Okay, And you can do that by doing 3 to 4 to 5, for example, that's another thing, to 12. Okay, so you can start at something that's not one, and you can go to something that's whatever you want, and you're just going to go one by one in that vector. Yes? So we don't need to use C now. So that's another way to create a vector, yes. You don't have to, to use C. However, this one, you can only generate a sequence that's uh, an increasing sequence of, of ones. Right? Um, so with the C, you can concatenate any numbers you want, so it's more flexible. But this is a quick way to, to, to uh, uh, create a vector. Uh, by the way, we're going to see a lot of uh, functions and things, and of course I'm not going to give you definitions for all of them. Sometimes we'll see them through examples. I think it's the best way to learn a language is to go through it, work with examples. So here, let's go back to creating that vector x1 to 12. Okay, so we know that we can query the length of x by typing length of x. And it's 12, right, because it's just 1 to 12. For a matrix or a table, you have dimensions, right? You need to know how many rows, how many columns do I have? Because here it is a vector, okay? If I type dim of x, which is what you would typically do for a matrix, we're going to see that in the example, it's going to tell me it doesn't work. It's not a matrix, right? It doesn't have a dimension. It's just a vector, so it has a length. However, I can actually... I can actually force it to be a matrix in that way, which is not really the way you would do it typically, but this is just to make you understand something. So I can say, I want the dimension of x to be three rows, four columns. If we look at x now, you're going to see there's three rows, four columns. We did not change x. x is still the same thing. It's just we told R to display it as a matrix. So this is just to tell you that for R, X is not a vector, it's nothing, it's just a bunch of numbers that are somewhere in memory, okay? And then we can tell R to display these numbers in specific ways, okay? So even though we do not change the actual values of the vector, for X, for R it is not a vector, it's just a bunch of numbers, you tell him display it as a vector, this is when we created the vector, now I tell him change the, the dimensions of x to make it a matrix and you can display it as a matrix. Okay? So this is not really how you would create matrices directly because it's, it's one way to do it but it's not the best way to do it. Uh, but it's just to show you that in fact a matrix is really nothing more complicated than the vector. It's just a vector that's arranged by row and columns. Typically you would create a matrix using the matrix function. Okay? So what you would do is that in that function you would put a bunch of numbers you would specify how many rows you want and then you can specify if you want to arrange these numbers if you want to go by rows or by columns so let's look at that so here I'm doing the exact same thing I say take the numbers 1 to 12 arrange them in the matrix with three rows and go by row so what this means going by a row is that you're going to go first 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so forth. And if you do this equal false, well, guess what? You're going to go by column. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, to 12. Okay? So it's just the way you arrange the number in your matrix. So a matrix is just a two-dimensional array of numbers, and you can arrange them as you want.
it's good because you can also give names to uh, rows and columns so here let's say I want to give some names to uh, uh, the rows of X okay and I'm gonna put some names to the columns of X and you're gonna see what this does if I look at X now you're gonna see that there's A B C 1 2 X Y so I get some names so this is good because you can arrange numbers, you can summarize numbers in a table, and you can put some names on it so that straight away here you could put, oh, this is patient one uh, on day A, on day B, on DC, or something like that. Okay, so it's a nice way to summarize numbers. Any questions about this? So it's pretty, pretty easy, pretty standard. We're going to see a lot of ways, there are a lot of ways in R to uh, put numbers in memory and to display numbers. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we've seen how to create matrices and arrays, and this is what you get if you do that. Uh, there are other ways, just like for the vector, we could use the C or the rep or the 1 to 12. There's various ways to create vectors and, and arrays. Why do we need that many ways to create vectors and, and um, matrices? Just because sometimes some ways are more convenient than others. It's just going to be faster. Okay, not really faster in the way it's going to take uh, in terms of time for R to create the vector of the matrix, but for you, how much typing you're going to need to do to create the object that you want. So matrices can also be formed by, if you want, gluing rows or columns using the CBIND and RBIND function. So this is the equivalent of the C for vectors. CBIND meaning I'm going to bind columns, RBIND meaning I'm going to bind rows. So let's look at an example. <coughs> Uh, here we are. So I'm, I'm going to create two vectors, x1 and x2. Okay, if I look at x1, x2, these are just vectors. And then I can create a matrix that I call my matrix. And I'm going to uh, bind x1 and x2 by row. Okay? So you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and it's binding by a row because x1 is the first row, x2 is the second row. Let's try to do the same thing but with C bind. Well, guess what? You're going to have the same thing, but you're going to bind them as columns. Okay? If I'm going too fast, if you've got questions, please ask me. Um, you can uh, create a match. You can actually, what's really nice too is that you can not only bind uh, vectors with vectors, you can bind a matrix with another vector as long as the dimension match. So here we get, so let's go back to this one. So let's take x1, x2, we create another vector y1. Here's my matrix. So let's copy and paste that. So we've got this matrix. Now I've got another vector called y1, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to paste that vector, that vector y1 over here, and I'd like to paste it just right here. Okay, so I'd like to add another column to my matrix. This is very similar to what I was asked earlier, is that can we add another number to a vector that's already uh, existing? The answer is yes. Here we can just create a new matrix that will be the previous matrix with another vector uh, glued at the end. So we can do that. And we can display my new matrix. And this is what we get. Okay, so we glued that vector at the end of the matrix. What if I want to glue that vector at the beginning of the matrix, the first column? Well, you can do the same thing, just put it here, okay, and this is going to be that, okay, so you can put it wherever you want. That makes sense? Okay. <clears throat> is there an easy way to erase one of the columns here? Or one of the numbers from the vector? Yes, we're going to see that. There's a very easy way to do it. And what about adding the, <coughs> the new column in the middle? 
you can do that too. It's to do that. It's it, you need to 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 do a little bit more things, but you can do it too. And we're going to see that we're going to talk more about indexing. So there's various ways to do indexing, and so basically what you need to do is to index the right column, the right, and then you can play with it. Why did the first in my matrix we have column column names one, two, three, four? Yeah. In the my new matrix we didn't have those. Because here you created a variable that's called y1, so by default R knows that this one is called y1, so it will add something that's called y1. The other, have a, uh, the other one didn't have any names here, so it, it doesn't put anything. Okay. Well, this is the, the default, but after you can change the name just as we've done before. You know, put row names and put the names and so forth. Okay. So in statistics, it's very common to have what we call uh, categorical data, right? Uh, such variables will be, for example, male or female, or uh, uh, could be a group, okay, placebo, treatment, treatment one, treatment two, uh, this drug, that drug, and so forth. So it, it's very common to have these sorts of things, and we want a way to handle these kinds of variables very easily. So for example, it would be nice if we could just condition on a specific variable. We say, okay, well, I just want to look at the male, I just want to look at the female. Okay, and the way we're going to deal with this is by creating variables that are called factors. Uh, and a factor will have a set of levels. So if we create a factor, um, um, a factor uh, for sex will be male or female, for example, the two levels. The, the good things about factors, once again, R is going to know how to deal with these kinds of variables because it is a, a categorical variable. And you can also assign meaningful names to the categories. So we're going to see that through an example. <clears throat> so here I'm going to use a categorical variable called uh, pain. Okay? And it's going to be the level of pain. So again, this is the example that's taken from the book. I give you the reference of it. So here you could have basically no pain, a little bit of pain, more pain, and a lot of pain. So this is, we've just created a vector, right? So if we look at pain, this is just a vector, nothing special. So we need to tell R to turn that into a, uh, a factor, okay? One way to do that is to say, put it, uh, turn this into a factor or turn it into as factor. So we're gonna create a new variable called F pain for factor. And then we're gonna say, take that vector in fact, here I could have just replaced that by pain if I wanted to as a factor. If we look at that, if we type it, you're going to see it's different. It's going to say levels 0, 1, 2, 3, because it knows it's a factor and there's four levels going from 0, 1, 2, 3. Excuse yes? You could do the same putting in, in between brackets the, the name of the actual vector, right? Yes, so we, that's what, I, yeah, that's what I said. Team. Could have said here, just pain. Okay. Like that. The exact same thing. Yes. Um, as factor will try to convert an existing vector into a, a, a vector factor. Factor you can sort of create factors from scratch. So in R, there's going to be lots of functions that could be a vector, for example, or something like that. And if you want to convert to something else, you could, you're going to do as that vector, as that matrix, and so forth. If you want to create something from scratch, you're just going to use vector, matrix, etc. So the as that is to say convert it to something. Okay, now the good things about these factors is that we can put them meaningful names. We can give them meaningful names. Okay, so now if we type uh, F pain, you're going to see that it's non, severe, medium, medium, mild. Okay, so we've got meaningful names. When I've got something, how do I know it is a vector, it is a factor, whatever? So this is related to the as that factor or the factor uh, question. We can just test if it is a factor. We can say, is that factor true? And if I use pain, it's going to be false because it's a vector. And I can do the same thing with vector. Is that vector pain true? But for f pain, it's false. So 
A factor is not a vector anymore for R. Even though it looks just like a vector, it's just because it's coded in a different way and R knows how to deal with uh, a factor differently than with a vector. And in fact, the ease that, you can do that for a lot of things. You can do that for matrices and so forth. So typically for any type of object, you can uh, uh, question whether it is from that type. And that's very helpful because sometimes you forgot, you know, you've got lots of variables, you're using a function, you don't understand why it doesn't really work. You can just sort of test if it's the right type. Okay, so we're not really going to go into that, but I just wanted to point out the difference between the two. Um, okay. <coughs> and probably, I don't, I mean, I don't know if Boris is going to talk about that, but factors can be very helpful in, when you're looking at uh, linear regression and sort of uh, these types of things because you can condition in something. Okay, so we've seen vectors, we've seen matrices, um, we've seen vectors of numeric, logical uh, characters. It's great, but it's, you always have to be very consistent in the way you store the objects, right? It has to be a vector of numeric, a matrix of numeric, a vector of characters. Sometimes it's nice to have a way to just bundle a bunch of objects together that you can work with, okay? And that way is called a list. So at least you can combine objects of possibly different kinds or size into a larger composite object. So we're going to see an example of that. So you can really think of a list as um, a complex vector. It's kind of like a vector, but you can put a bunch of stuff in it. It doesn't matter if it's not the same thing, if it's not the same size. Okay, so let's create a vector x a vector of factors, and a vector of characters. Okay? Now I'm, no, I'm going to create a list where the, where the first element is going to be age, uh, the second one is going to be sex, and the third one is just going to be some metadata that uh, are related to uh, the other two variables. Okay? And you can see here that x and y do not have the exact same length and Z is completely unrelated. But we can actually bundle all of these three variables into one element called a list. And if we look at my list, you can see that the first one is age, sex, and metadata. And the way you create a list, um, the name of the variables that you give, I will use them as the names of the variable in your list. Then you can, assess, you can access uh, each specific variable typing the name of that variable. So if I want to look at age, I can just do dollar sign and the name of the variable. So this is the way to uh, access specific elements in the list using their names. If you want to look at uh, meta, you just do the same thing. Okay? So list is really a great way to put a lot of objects together. Uh, and in fact, it's one of the beauty in R is that you can create lists like that. So for those who know uh, programming a little bit, a list is kind of like a structure. You can put a bunch of, of elements of different kinds into uh, kind of like a bundle. <clears throat> okay, so Here's another great thing about R. Um, it's, it's a great uh, type of uh, object in R. It's called a data frame. So a data frame is just like a data matrix or a data set. So we're dealing with data sets, so it would be nice to have a way to store that. We've seen the two-dimensional array. Uh, that's kind of like a data frame almost, but a data frame you can actually uh, be a little bit more flexible. In fact, a data frame is almost like a list. <clears throat> and it's used when you've got um, when you want to put objects together that have the same length and where each of the elements across the different, um, let's say, vectors of the same position across come from the same experimental unit. So let's say you've got several patients and on each of these patients you're going to get, you're going to take several measurements, then you can put that into what's called a data frame. So you're going to understand very quickly what um, data frame can be used for. <clears throat> so we, um, before we had um, the variable sex here, I'm going to create a data frame with age and sex. 
And let's display that. Okay, so you can see that in a data frame there is a grouping structure. That is, let's say this is one patient, this is another patient, this is the third patient, and so forth. The age and the sex are paired together. They are coming from the same uh, unit, the same uh, person. And just like a list, you can actually um, access each of the element of your data frame using its name. Yeah. Yes. What if you have also the, the variable make meta? And we can try that. It will be London school, London school, London school, whatever. Uh, this wasn't that. It should be uh, my list. Okay. So it did not really give you an error, but sometimes you, be, you need to be a little bit careful because the object should have the same size. It's kind of like what I talked to you earlier about. Sometimes I will say, that's fine, I can do it, but I'm just going to recycle the elements of that vector. Okay. So of course, R is great, does a lot of things, but you need to be careful about what you do. <coughs> So we're going to be working with data frames because it's a nice way to summarize things. So for example, if you're looking at a gene expression data set, you're going to have genes, okay, this could be uh, the units of your experiment, and then you're going to have all the variables you're looking at, right? Expression in the first array, a time one, time two, time three, uh, under this condition, and so forth. So we're going to be using a lot of data frames. So why do we need data frames if it is simply a list? Right? It is just a list because if, we, if you remember, if we go back to this, it looks just like a list in the sense that I can access independent variable using the dollar sign and the name, right? which is what we've done here, like that. Well, it's just that it's more efficient storage to begin with because you can because there's a relationship between each of the element of each variable but also and more importantly because it makes it much easier to index things so for example if you want to get uh, the patient one all the variables all the measurements from patient one you can do that very efficiently in the list you will need to have each variable in a different element of the list and will be a lot more difficult because you don't know which one goes with which so when you know that there's a natural, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> when you've got data set, we've got rows and columns, data frame is the natural way, okay? And why is it different than just a uh, uh, data matrix? It's because you can store, uh, columns can have different types. So here you could have a vector of factor, a vector of characters, a vector of numeric, and so forth. Something that you couldn't really do with a matrix, a matrix needs to be all numeric or, or all of the same kind, just like a vector. So a list is just, uh, a data frame is just like a, a special kind of list, which is more efficient when you've got sort of squared data. <clears throat> okay, so here we're gonna talk about something that's um, pretty important, it's called indexing. So we've seen indexing a little bit with the vectors, how we can get to uh, specific elements, but now we're gonna see some examples of how to do uh, a very efficient indexing to get to the elements you really care about. So let's go to that example. So we've got the pain vector. So I'm just still in memory, but I'm going to recreate it here. So <clears throat> we've seen how to look at the first, the second element, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, the third, okay? One thing is that what if you do um, pain of 10? So here you can say that it gives you NA because the length of the vector is less than 10. So it's going to tell you there's no element there because it's less than 10. So it's going to give you it's not a number. There's nothing. Okay? So it gives you an error because you're going out of bounds if you want. Once again, it's clever enough that even though you're going out of bound, it's just giving you an NA. It's still going to work. So you need to be a little bit careful. Sometimes it's nice because other uh, languages will typically just break down. and So you can't do that because you're sort of going out of bounds. Here it's saying 
Okay, it works, but it, it gives you sort of a weird value, this, uh, not an, uh, the um, missing value uh, time. So it can be good and bad. It depends what you do. You need to be a little bit careful. Now let's say I want the elements uh, 1 and 2. You can just do from 1 to 2. That's going to give me these. From 1 to 3, from 1 to 5, or 4, and so forth. Well, it doesn't have to start at 1. You can just do go from 2 to 3. And you get that. 2 to 4, 2 to 5, etc. It doesn't have to be uh, in continuity either, so you can just do C of 1 and 3. So what this is doing is that it will create a vector of indices 1 and 3. And then you're going to say, OK, let's just get me 1 and 3 from the vector pane. 1 and 4, and so forth. OK? And you can put more than two, you can put five, then two, okay? And it's going to reorder them, so it's gonna give you first the first element, then the fourth element, then the fifth, and then the third. Okay, does that make sense? Pretty simple. So someone asked earlier, what if we just want to remove a column or remove an element or something? Well, you can do that very easily. You can do the same thing, but you put a minus sign in front of the index. And that's going to tell R, I want the vector, but remove the fifth element. Oops. I need to copy it first. OK, we do that. Bang, here we are, the vector without the last element. And you can do that with any of the elements. You can remove the first one, remove the second one. You can actually remove two and three. You can remove one and three. I mean, you get the idea. It's very powerful. You can do a lot of things. <coughs> yeah? It has to be of a column, or can you specify some specific values in that column for some rows, which took place like in A or C? We're going to see that. So you, we, we can do what's called uh, conditional indexing. So this is probably what you meant. Well, we'll get to that. So for a matrix, so we still had my matrix that we've created earlier. OK, this is it. What if we want <coughs> first uh, element or the first row, first column? Well, we're going to index it in the same way, but we put a comma to separate rows and columns. Okay, and here we should get one. Let's say we want first row, third column, fifth. Oh, it's out of bound because there's only four columns here. If we get uh, two and four, okay, we'll give you the respective element. You can do the same thing as with vectors. You can do one to two. Okay, and this will say, okay, I want in the fourth column, I want the first and second elements. So it's four and eight. You can actually remove, uh, leave empty either the, the row or the column. And what this will do is that it says, take the first row and the second row. Okay, of course, it's the whole matrix because there's only two rows. You can do the first column, uh, the first row, the second row, the first column, the second column, and so forth. So indexing is very powerful. Okay, <clears throat> and that's why it's so nice to work with matrices or uh, data frames is because right away you can get to the row, the column that you want, or the elements that you want very, very quickly. Uh, we can do the same thing. Let's say we want the data, uh, the, we want the matrix, but we don't want uh, the second column. So we're going to put a minus 2 in front of the column number, and that's going to give you the matrix without the column. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah? We can also index list. So we've created my list before, so let's look at it again. <coughs> so we've, we've seen that to index variables in the list, we can just give them names. <coughs> okay. So that's one way to index using the name. We can also index using the brackets. Say, let's, let's take only the first element of the list. Let's take one to two. OK? 
Okay, so you can index the variables like that. And that's kind of a sorry, that's kind of a neat way to do it too, because you can just select a couple of variables in your list. Now, if you want to uh, uh, access the elements of variables within that list, you can either do like that. So you take, let's say, age, and then of course you can look at the first element of that, the second, the third, and so forth. Okay. Don't read too much. I know there's there's a bit of information here with the indexing. It's pretty tricky. Uh, sometimes you know I don't even remember all the ways you can index something. You can all. I mean, you're going to learn through the examples uh, we're going to visit this afternoon and probably later uh, this morning. Now let's say I really want to extract uh, the variable from the list. I would put double brackets. So double brackets, you're going to see the difference between just putting just one bracket. It still leaves me with the, with the meta. So here I would have to put the name. Here it removes the names and it just put the, the actual content of that variable. Okay, so that's the difference here. Because if I do this, if I want to index after the variables here, <clears throat> it's not going to work because it's going to give me the, the meta variable. If I look at this, so this is going to give me the first element of the variable, like that. Oops. So this is equivalent to doing that. That's just another way to do it. Okay. Sometimes your element in your list might not have names, so that's the only way you can uh, access these elements. Okay. Don't worry too much. We'll revisit some of that. Uh, we've created a data frame earlier. Okay. So a data frame is really just like a matrix, except that the types, uh, the, the variable type can be different across columns uh, um, in, in the data matrix. <coughs> so we can just index the first row. That's nice because you know you can see right away why it's more efficient than a list. It's because because we've got the natural uh, pairing of, of observations across rows. We can just extract one patient right away. Say this is oh he's 31. That's a female, and, and this is the metadata. We can do the same thing too. We can extract a variable, okay, using the column and so forth. Does that make sense? It's pretty easy. We just have to remember how to do all these things. Okay. Uh, we're going to see something that's very, very important, very uh, interesting in R. It's called conditional indexing. Okay, it's a very quick way to get to the numbers you really care about. So the 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 trick is that indexing can be conditional on another variable. Okay, so let's say you've got a very complex data set, and you'd like to extract the variables or the measurements that are uh, that were taken on Friday before uh, seven o'clock and sex is female, whatever. You, this is the sort of things you can do with conditional indexing. So we're going to see an example. So once again, we're going to create pain, a sex vector of the same length and age. Okay, so let's look at this. We've got pain, we've got sex, we've got age. Okay. <clears throat> first one is just a, a numerical vector, this one is a factor, and this one is a numerical vector. <coughs> Let's say I want to look at the panes for only the males. So what I'm going to say is look at pain, but such as the sex is equal to M, so that it's male. Okay? So you can do that like that. What you're going to get is that you can see the, this one is zero, this one is three, and the last one is one. Okay, so you're only going to get to the elements for which uh, the patient was a male. Now, you can see that this is pretty stra straightforward, seems very natural in the way you do that for the, conditional, the uh, conditioning, but you might ask yourself, why is there two equal signs? Why not just one? Okay. Does anyone know that? Yeah, but why why do we have two equal signs here, not just one? Equal a single one is when you are assigning something, right? Good. So 
in many programming language, the way you're going to assign a value to something is with the equal sign. In R, at first, it wasn't with the equal sign. It's with the, the, the uh, left arrow, as we've seen. Okay? And in fact, it's the best way to do it because it's less confusing. You can really see it's different, uh, different from the equal sign. Uh, but in fact, in R, you can also assign with the equal sign. I did not tell you that because I don't want you to do it because it's not really good, right? Because it's very confusing. You don't know if it's really equal or assignment. So it's, it, it's safer to just use the uh, left arrow for assignment. Even though a lot of people, you know, are kind of lazy, just like me, but uh, they prefer to use the equal sign because just one character versus two characters. Well, guess what? It doesn't make a very big difference if you use two characters or one character. But it's going to make a lot of difference when you start, you know, coding and things, and you have to re to read your code, and there's an error, you don't know where it comes from, and so forth. Because if you do that, <coughs> let's try to do that with the equal sign. What's going to happen? Na. You don't really understand why, right? Because what this is doing is that it's going to. Let's look at the variable. Fix. Um, if you do that. <coughs> Right? So you've assigned a new value to your variable. Okay? So it's a bit confusing. And that's why when you put the two equals, it's just going to know, R is going to know that it's you're making a comparison between two things. Okay? So it's just to make it very clear to R that it's not an assignment, it's just a comparison. You can do things similarly with. Um, uh, with greater or less example. So here, let's say I want to, uh, so I'm just going to recreate the sex variable first. And let's say I want all the pain for the patients that are uh, at least 32, at least uh, greater than 32. Okay, so I do that. And you can see it's going to extract all the elements except the one who is 32, which is that one. Okay, so you get 0, 3, 2, 1. Does that make sense? Other thing is that you can actually combine things. So you can say, okay, I want age greater than 32 and sex is male. Okay, so if you look at the two, it's going to be 0, 3, and 1. You could do less than 32, less or equal than 32, and sex is female. Okay. So you can play with these sorts of things very quickly. Or you could do either it is less or equal than 32, um, it's less or equal than 40, or it is a female. Okay. So you can play with and, or, and things like that. So you are doing that on the list, right? You, because you have the created a list including those three variables. I'm doing that on the vector. Because the, 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 actually it's three variables. They don't have to be in a list. They're separated variables. Yeah. Well, as long as they have the same length, it makes sense to do these sorts of things. And if they don't, they will sort of give you an error or warning. OK. <coughs> so try to do the same thing of indexing with the female and then do the same thing with age less than 80 and um, separately and then combine the two. You say I want all the female that are less than 80 okay? and I want to look at the values of the pain. So try to do that. So I trust that you should be able to do it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so we want it first less than 80. So we're going to do that. OK. And then you want it sex is uh, female. OK. And if you want to combine the two, 
Okay, you need to be a little bit careful. Here it means that it's strictly less than 80. If you want to do less or equal than 80, you put it that way. Less or equal, greater or equal. Okay. So one thing you can do also to check your indexing if it's doing the right thing, you can actually take the variable you're trying to condition upon, like sex, and you do say oops. Right? Nothing stops you from doing that. And this that way you will check that this is actually grabbing the right uh, patient or the right index of the variable. Right? Here it should all be female. If you do age such as age less or equal than 80, it should be plus all less or equal than 80. Okay, so it's doing the right thing. Yes? No. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so we've seen conditional indexing, we've seen all the pretty much all the, the, the types of variable we're going to use and we're going to need. The first thing we need to know now is while we're doing statistics, <coughs> excuse me, well, we need to read data into R. How are we going to get our data into R, right? Um, actually, someone has uh, asked me a question on how do we get data from Excel into R, right? Because sometimes people will send you these Excel files which I find really annoying because you need to have Excel and uh, you need to how to deal with these sorts of things. But uh, it's actually not too difficult to get your data from Excel into R. The best way to do it will be to open your, uh, your Excel file using Excel and then you can do save as, either as a text file or a CSV, and then you can read that into R with the read that table function. Okay. So in R, it's pretty easy to uh, read data. So one thing you have to know is that your data, it's, it's pretty easy, but you've, if you've got very complicated data, lots of, of characters and things, very messy, uh, probably you don't because if you open your data in Excel, it's probably uh, clean enough anyway. But sometimes you, it can get slightly more complicated. But for typical data sets, it's very easy. So here we're going to try to read in the uh, GVHD data set. So it's a flow cytometry data set lo looking at the graft versus host disease uh, in a patient that actually had that, uh, have that disease. <coughs> OK, so here's going to be a tricky part. Let's try to do that right away. What do I get? Well, I can find the data set, right? Because you need to tell R where are you going to look for that data set, right? So one way to do it, <coughs> and I don't know how it works on uh, um, on Windows, but there's a way where you can actually uh, tell him where to look for things. Oops. So you can change the directory. So here on, on my mic, if I go into uh, uh, Miss and I look for a change working directory, I can do that and I'm going to tell R, I want my directory, my working directory, where I'm going to put all of my data, where I'm going to put all of, me, all of my output and so forth to be just desktop. Okay? And here I can see, oh, here's the data, that's fine, this is where I want. So in Windows, you probably have something very similar where you can change your directory. Under file? Okay, so if you go under file, you're going to have a comment that says change directory, set that to be your desktop. Assuming that you've put the data sets on your desktop. Is that okay for everyone? If you've got a problem, raise your hand. You can really raise your hand if you've got a problem, that's okay. Or you can ask your neighbor if you want to. You know, I, it probably seems like a lot of things to do. You're going to tell R to do this and that. But you've got to think that, you know, R is, is probably very intelligent. So is your computer. But if you don't tell him where the data is and what data you're talking about, it's going to be very difficult for him to work with the data set, right? 
And it's not very difficult to do. You just go and say, look on the desktop. So now that you've, you've done that, let's try to uh, input that comment again. And now it's working, right? Because it knows that the file you're looking for is on the desktop. So you can load that. In fact, there's another way to do that. You could also give the full path of where exactly the data is. But that's, the syntax is sometimes can be a bit tricky because you know Windows and Mac is slightly different, so it's much easier to just do and change the working directory. And in fact, in general, it's it's a good way to do it. You create a directory somewhere, let's say on your desktop or whatever, you put all your data in it, you work in it so that you remember that all the results and everything will be in the same at the same place where you have your data. Is that okay for everyone? Okay. So now we've read in the, <coughs> the data set, we've read that table. By default, this is going to give you a data frame. Okay? So when you read a data set like that, R assumes that it is a data frame. There are other ways to read data to create lists and things when it's not exactly of the same size. But for all of what we're going to do, we're just going to deal with data frames. So because it is a data frame, we can actually look at things like that. So we can look at the 10 first rows of that data frame. You can see that. So here I put an option uh, in, in the function that says header is equal to true. Right? It's because there is a header. The variables have names. And when you read the data set, you're going to tell R to look for these names. And R is going to use them for uh, when creating the data frame. Okay, we look at the first 10 rows and you can see there's numbers. Do you don't put the 10 rows and if you just get the whole table, then you're going to, there is not enough space in the R console and then you're going to not be able to get back to at the beginning of what you started to write, right? Try it. I did. And okay. I, so now it's 9,000 data points and I just have the last whatever. That's the maximum that the console supports. Exactly. So, so, so can I access? Is, it a way, is there a way in which I could access the, the other lines above this? Or it's lost? No, it's not lost. Uh, you can just scroll up the window. But it could be that it, it, it filled up that window, so you've sort of lost but it in a way. Once I scroll the whole thing up, it stops at the six. Then you lost it, yeah. It's okay. because you, there's only a maximum number of lines you can have in your window. But there's one, there's one thing that you, that you can do when you're looking for comments that were very high up or you don't remember. There's history. You can actually do question mark history and that will tell you a little bit about how to go back to, uh, to previous comments. Okay? And then Why do you need the comma after the 10? Because I wanted the first 10 rows. But before, you, when you're doing a range, you didn't have to put a comma after you just put it. Like here? Uh, no. With the, uh, when you're using the colon, like what, uh, whatever, you don't need to put a comma after it? You know it depends. If it's a, well, if, if it's a matrix, you need to put a comma because there are rows and columns. If it's just okay. a vector, you don't need the, okay. the comma. Okay? So going back to your question while someone is still getting set up at the, uh, the back, you can go in the history and you can say, okay, I want to, I don't remember, I know I've typed something like that, I don't remember exactly what it was. There's a history in R, okay, it's going to try to, to remember what you've done, and you can actually look for a specific pattern. So I could say, okay, I want to look at a history that contains age. Pattern. Okay, well, it doesn't work on my machine here, but because I used the GUI that I, I never used before. But uh, typically, you can do that and go back to the history. I don't know if you try in your machine if, if that actually works, but 
That's one way to do it. Okay, so we did read in the, uh, the data frame, and here we can look at each of the rows, like the first 10 rows. We can also look. Could it look at two equals? Could it be that? No, it shouldn't be. Yeah, it's just because for me, I've got a special setup on my machine, so. Because I never used the GUI, so I just put the GUI t this morning to, to, to be able to show you. But. Good. Um, are we okay in the back? I guess not. No? Okay? Okay. Yes. Uh, so you're going to be able to say what's in memory, things like that, but not what's typed there. You're going to be able to, to save the comments you've typed and the variables, uh, but you're not going to be able to, to, to save the output. Or if you really want to save it, just do a print or, some, or copy and paste into another document. But typically there's no real reason to save it because if you save all of the variables and all of the comments, you can just re-execute everything. Okay, so we can do the same thing, grabbing the first column, the second column, and so forth. If you, if you want to save some, some of the sequences of uh, commands, then it's better to do it in the on screen and save, that, save the screen. Yes, so absolutely. It's always better to have a file that contains all of your comments. Uh, you, you yeah, you need to change. Good, everyone? Okay. Okay, so we, we can read the file. This is what it looks like. It contains all the information we need, we can work with. Um, there are a couple of things that you should know as well is that R comes with lots of packages and functions. And often these functions have a help file and it's very useful to have data sets to use these um, um, help files. So typically you can also get lots of data sets in R ready. Okay? So for example, there's a, a data set called Iris, which is about a um, bunch of flowers and things, measurements on, on, on specific flowers. You can just type data Iris and that will load that data set. So you can try that. Okay? And that will load the data. You see it worked. And then if you go, if you type iris, let's look at the first element, you will see something. First row, you can see that uh, looking at the length of the sepal and the petal. So sometimes they, it's nice because you can get some data sets already in R. Uh, you can create packages and bundle data sets in them. So it's very good because it makes it easier to do reproducible research. You can package your code with your data you know, and the people can just reproduce exactly what you've done. <clears throat> okay, is that okay for the input of data? Yeah. Just one stupid question. Where was the iris data? Because it's already as part of the R package that we installed. Yes. So the the um, that one is actually part of the base distribution. There are other data sets that are within specific packages. So if you just type data and um, Actually, here's an example. If you type data crabs, that's not going to work. Okay? Because it doesn't know. 
but it's actually part of another package, which is, is it, it's called mass, and we're going to see that. So I can load that package, and then I can load the data, and it's working now. Okay. So when specific data sets are within a package, you first need to load the package. For the iris, it's part of the base distribution, so you don't need to do anything. So some of them, um, you, the packages will always be on a computer for you to be able to load them. But you can download them from somewhere else, install them, and then use them. There are some packages that come with the distribution. So that one is actually coming from uh, R. When you install R, you will have that package as well. Okay? That's just because you don't need all of them at once. There's no need to load everything, right? It's better to just load packages for your specific needs. So <clears throat> that's a good question. So when do we use small or capital letters? Uh, um, so R is actually case sensitive. So when you have a variable, when you've got an object, a, a package, whatever, you need to make sure that you've got the right uh, either small or capital letters, right? And it makes it's it's nice because you can uh, create more variables and put specific names and things. But sometimes you can create a bit of confusion, so you need to be a bit careful about that. So here it's just because the package is called mass. So often we've got acronyms, it's easier to put capital letters, right? So that's why. Okay? Did you have another question? <laughs> Okay, that's that's a basic question, but it's a good question because there's obviously lots of formats you can have for files, right? So you could you could have a tab delimited file, you could have space in between uh, numbers, you could have uh, lots of various things, right? So R tries to be very clever. When you use uh, read that table, you will try to guess which format it is and and how to read the table. But I'm sure very soon you will encounter uh, cases where it doesn't do what you want. So you can specify that. If you don't know, just do question mark, read that table, okay? And you're going to see that there are a bunch of options here, okay? And one of them <coughs> is called SEP. So you can do the separation, it could be either a tab, it could be a space, it could be whatever. By default, it will, it will take any space, either tab, space, things to be a delimitation between two numbers or two uh, measurements or variables. You can have a header, you can have no header, uh, you can do lots of various things. Okay? Yeah. When R imports data, does it try to guess what type of data it is? Yes. Is it a numerator or vector? But, and if it finds <coughs> that one of the rows uh, is, is, a, is not a, a number, it automatically assumes that none of them is a number? No, and typically it will, it will put a missing, a missing value. If one of them is missing or is not no, a number or one something. Of them, let's say if you have data that has, uh, well, that has words and some that have numbers, will it just assume yes. that everything is. Yes. Is, uh, each column is. So each column is like a vector if you want. And it has to have the same type either character or uh, numeric or uh, logical, whatever. That's good. Because Excel doesn't do that. Excel does a lot of bad things. Right? <laughs> Don't get me started. But I when I open a CSV file with names of teams, some of them become the dates, some yeah. of those names. Okay. <coughs> so you didn't know about functions and arguments, but we've used functions since the beginning of the workshop, right? Every, everything we do in R, it's a specific comment, and there's some arguments that we put. Like read that table, we put an argument, the file name, uh, header equal true, false, whatever. Read that table is a function that is depending on the argument, it will do different things. So a function is just like a mathematical uh, formula of function applied to one or more arguments. So here's just one function, log, it will just take the log of x. But you can do other things. So you can plot the weight versus height, and we're going to see some plotting functions. So something you need to be very careful about uh, when you use an R function <coughs> is the order of the variables that you use. So when you plot, when you do that, plot weight versus height, R assumes that the first argument is the x variable and the second is the y variable. 
Okay? If you want to do the other way around, you will have to do height and then weight. Okay? If you do not know how to specify the arguments, you should look at question mark plot. What are the arguments? What are the possible options I can use, etc. In some of the functions that we've used, like read that table, if you do question mark read that table, you can see there's there are tons of arguments, but we did not specify that many arguments. We just said name of file header equal to. It's because by uh, <clears throat> by default R is going to try to guess the values of all the arguments you don't specify. So for most of the functions, arguments come from uh, they come with sensible default. Okay, and therefore you can omit these arguments. So for example, if you want to plot uh, do a scatter plot of weight versus height, and we're going to see that. By default, the color is uh, going to be black, which is coded as 1. So when you do just pl uh, plot weight versus height, it's basically doing the same thing as this. Okay, So there's a default for, the, for that parameter that you don't have to care about. Except if you want to change it. If you want to change the color, then you can do it very easily. Do color equal red, equal 2, whatever. <coughs> Um, going back to the arguments, so if you do not specify the names of the argument, just like here, weight and height, the order is very important, right? Because you will assume that the first one is the first argument of the function, which is x, the second one is the second argument of the function, which is y. So sometimes it's better to be very explicit. So here you could do the exact same thing, but do plot x is equal to weight, y is equal to height. Okay, that way all will know for sure that this one is x, this one is y. Okay, and in fact, you should always be very, very careful to specify the name of the variables and try to use the same order as R, so x and y. Even though if you do y and x, if you specify the name, it will work, you will run into a lot of trouble, you know, if you don't specify the same order because sometimes you will forget the names and you won't realize that you did and therefore you will get something completely different than what you expected. So try to be careful in respecting the name, putting the name of the variables in the same order that will save you a lot of time later. So we'll see some examples of that. Library. So this is one of the strengths of R is that there is R, but there's all the other libraries that all the other guys in the world have written and that you can use for free. <coughs> These are available on some specific websites. So there are a couple of websites where you can uh, download libraries. One of them is called CRAN, which is just the uh, uh, repository for our packages, uh, just typical uh, our packages. There's Bioconductor, which is geared towards genomics, uh, where you can download packages. And these things can be done very easily within R directly. <coughs> And of course, some of the packages are also distributed with R, as I just said earlier. <coughs> so if you do, let's try to do something. If you do uh, library survival, which is a package to do survival analysis, which is included with R, it works, OK? Because it's included. Not Note also that when you try to load a package that requires other packages, it will load these packages automatically. So here it says, I'm loading the package splines because survival uses some functions of splines. And this is great because you can customize packages. You can write your own package, but you don't have to rewrite the function that does this and that. You can just use you know, the package from John and that function that Mark uh, wrote in the other package. You can just load these, fun these functions from the other packages when you need them. And therefore, it's very uh, easy to write packages that, that are very uh, customizable to uh, respect to what you want to do. Now, let's try to use another package. That package is called SAMR, which we're going to use later and try to type that on your machine. Does it work? You don't get the same thing here? That's bizarre. It's because it's not a default package, right? So we need to install that package before you can load it. So for me, I've, I installed it yesterday um, because I know we're going to use it. But for you, you can just do it right away. So again, on the Mac, you can just do, go into Package Manager. On Windows, I don't really know how you do it. 
uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. <coughs> Actually, it's not package manager, it's a package installer. And there's various sources for your packages. There's CRAN, there's Bioconductor, and other things. So here's just in CRAN. You can search for the name of the package, so it's SAM R, and you search for it, okay? <coughs> If you don't find it, there's a, a very easy way to do it through the command line as well, so don't worry too much about it. Okay? You can select and you do install selected package. Okay, it's that easy. The other thing you can do as well is just to do install that packages and the name of the package. And by default, you know that it comes from CRAN, so you don't have to worry about it. And if you do that, it should install the package for you. See? It's downloading the package, it's installing the package all automatically. Okay, there's a couple of warnings and things when you install the package, but it's not really a big deal. So it's another way to do it. In fact, I always install my packages this way because it's easier for me. I have scripts to install all the packages that I want all the time. But for you, it's probably easier to use the GUI. And you can just do that very efficiently. If you don't know how to do it, if you're running into some problems, just raise your hand and, and we'll get to you and we'll install the package. Um, as everything with R, the first time you do it, it takes forever because you don't know how to do it. Once you know how to do it, you've done it, it's easy, it's always going to be the same thing. <clears throat> so again, if you need help, raise your hand. 